Benvenuti a tutti. Eh, vorrei prima di tutto ringraziare eh, per un caloroso invito eh, da parte degli organizzatori di questa conferenza, eh, prima di tutto il professore Luca Malavasi, anche a, eh, la collega Elisa Bricco, eh, per avermi dato infatti eh, questa seconda opportunità di ritornare a Genova, come abbiamo già sentito, eh, sono stato qui eh, l'anno scorso eh, in una conferenza, cioè in un, in un summer school organizzato proprio dall'Università di Genova, eh, quando erano presenti anche, mi pare, Francesco Casetti, eh, Michele Cometa e alcuni altri eh, scienziati e eh, mi sono trovato veramente molto bene eh, dunque nel, nel 2000, 2012. Uh, 2018. Uh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. uh, va bene, uh, and now for something completely different I will change uh, the language because I was asked uh, to, to give this presentation in English, so uh, I, I will try to do, uh, to do my best. Uh, uh, at the beginning of, the, of this presentation I would like to remind of uh, one saying of uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Tom Mitchell from the University of Chicago, who said uh, at one conference, I think it was in, uh, in Berlin, in the Haus der Kulturen der Welt, uh, back in, uh, I mean, uh, last year. So it's a very fresh, uh, very fresh statement, a very simple one, but uh, which in fact uh, somehow encompasses uh, something that, uh, I mean, at least the, the procedure that I would like to have uh, uh, this afternoon uh, here. Uh, well, he said, uh, all that I want to, uh, to do here is uh, to tell you the story. And in fact, this is uh, exactly what I want to do here, to tell you uh, a story. Of course, uh, I can only hope that uh, my story will be as interesting as uh, stories uh, from uh, Professor Mitchell are, but uh, I will try to do it uh, doing some, some digressions or deviations and uh, you know, uh, lateral insights how, how you know, the thing, things go uh, with this thing. Uh, so, uh, I was present here uh, today uh, during, the, during the first session and uh, I think we had a really marvelous opportunity to see how these uh, philo philosophical, uh, philosophical investigations on postmodern uh, condition uh, stand right now. But uh, what we uh, definitely need to include in this conversation is the status uh, of images, the uh, status of uh, moving pictures that are uh, the inevitable part of the, of the things that, uh, of all things concerned with the, with the postmodern. So uh, that will be my, uh, my, main, uh, my main topic uh, here. I will, uh, in order to do that, in order to uh, present you some, uh, some investigation or, or, or some, some thinking, thinking of mine regarding images, uh, I will first go, uh, let's say, uh, 20, some 20 years back to, uh, to a few insights of, uh, of the famous Slovenian, uh, Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Žižek, but then I will make a very, very huge uh, step in the, in the history toward the, towards the Middle Ages. And uh, with, this, uh, with this very, uh, even, even uh, incredibly uh, long time span, I will have. Uh, I will try to uh, to make my point. Uh, so uh, basically, what my presentation here is about. I mean, uh, what uh, it is a sort of plaidoyer, but uh, plaidoyer for a uh, for a radically new kind of uh, thinking in relation to images. The thinking uh, that would uh, reconnect once again images, not with the reality, which uh, which I think. Uh, is the, uh, the, the, the most common error that uh, all of us are doing, especially now with, the, with this, uh, with this uh, I don't know, uh, pictorial mass media extravaganza with social media, media and everything else. We have uh, become to believe that uh, what happens on, on the screens, that uh, this is the reality. Uh, my claim is that uh, image is uh, basically and uh, definitely ontologically not a reality. An image is something that refers exclusively to itself. Uh, it does not refer to, to the world. 
to the to the things that are happening in in a let's say physical reality. So I images are world on their own. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to I would like to share with you uh, some uh, some opinions of the former mentioned uh, Slavoj Žižek, who back in 2002 in his uh, famous essay uh, "The Return of the Real" somehow uh, put all these um, all these questions to the fore. Um, I don't even think that uh, he did it. Uh, he did this, He did it on purpose. He just wanted to comment on the, what was uh, what was a very pressing pressing issue back then, and that was the the attack on the World World, uh, World Trade Center in New York in 2001. So, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to remind you uh, of some passages uh, from his uh, from his essay, uh, passages that will uh, that will make a great uh, great intro, great prolegomena into the into the problem that I want to not just stress here, but uh, somehow resolve as well. So, what is it that uh, that uh, Slava Žižek said back then in 2000, 2002, a year after the attack on the on the uh, twins in New York City? Well, he said, what happened on 9-11 on suddenly came into our reality as a phantasmatic screen illusion, but not, not in such a way that reality disturbed the image we have of reality, but that the image itself penetrated reality and shattered our notion of it. So I think uh, this is may maybe one of the most, uh, most pregnant moments, uh, almost involuntarily. So his, uh, uh, I believe his intention wasn't to give some philosophical insight on the status of the images, but uh, he just felt so, uh, you know, so pressed, so intrigued uh, to uh, um, to pronounce something that was uh, that something that was, uh, you know, uh, really like a, an, an, uh, a contemporary uncanny that uh, had that needed to be to to be presented at the, this uncanny moment that he uh, so succinctly presented in this in this sentence is the the relationship between images and reality so i think the this is a typical uh, postmodern stance when you don't really know what are you looking at and when the when the media itself uh, already went so uh, so Predominant in the in the sphere of communication, that uh, the difference between uh, images and reality uh, was uh, very different, uh, very very difficult uh, to tell. I will also uh, mention uh, another uh, another st statement, which uh, which is uh, three pages further, which uh, which even uh, even more precisely goes uh, in, in the direction of uh, of my um, of my idea here to present. Well, what does he say? Uh, you have this, uh, these letters in, uh, in my youth school, these, these are my, uh, my emphasis uh, in order to, to give you, uh, to, to, to point your attention to the most, more, most important topics and terms that I would like to discuss. So, he says uh, about this uh, WTC uh, uh, occurrence uh, then in New York. So he said, this is what the compelling image of the collapse of the WTC was, an image a semblance, an effect, which at the same time delivered the thing itself. This effect of the real is not the same as what Roland Barthes, way back in 1960s, called le fait du réel. It is rather its exact opposite, le fait du, du réel. So, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here, I'm trying to say here that uh, Slavoj Žižek, uh, even though he's uh, obviously very conversant and very, not very knowledgeable about uh, all these things that relate uh, social phenomena, uh, he obviously made some mistakes uh, when it comes to defining the position, the ontological position, first of all, uh, in regards uh, to images. Uh, so uh, when, you come to, when you come to compare images and reality, uh, images as, a, as a self-standing entities and uh, on one side and their effects on, on the other, then you have to be very sure uh, of what you are talking about. So what, what we have here? We have here on one side, we have an image, we have a semblance, and we have an effect. So this belongs to the, uh, let's say, to the order of images, something which is uh, ontologically, uh, uh, ontologically defined by itself and by, uh, by some uh, by some philosophical investigations made, for example, by by Gottfried Bem and his uh, and his uh, famous uh, 
famous uh, claim of uh, iconic uh, difference. This is on one side. On the other side, almost uh, put in the same sentence, Zizek uh, mentions effect of the real and effect of uh, something what is, uh, what is not real or for something what is uh, unrealistic. So my, my question is, how can, we, uh, how can we at the same time explain images in terms of, uh, of reality and in terms of unreality? Uh, and this is something that really uh, that really bothered me when I was uh, reading this uh, this article. And uh, Zizek here gave me a very uh, very powerful uh, schlagwort for uh, for my whole uh, for my whole uh, presentation. So uh, first, I would like to explain to you why I think that uh, images should and can only work. On their own level, on on their uh, with the with their own powers and possibilities, while the, the reality itself, on the other hand, does not does not enter and uh, in effect doesn't have any any relation uh, to reality. So, uh, in my opinion, images and reality are two distinct uh, ontological uh, stances, two two uh, distinct ontological positions, which uh, can never come into, into collision. But of course, there are some instances in which this can uh, occur. And I, 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 uh, I would like to show you which are those instances uh, at which uh, we can, uh, we can uh, be tempted to confuse images with real. Uh, first, of, uh, first of this uh, uh, claim, I mean the question that I here make is uh, can, can, can we claim that images deliver the, the reality? Well, as you may reckon already, I claim that uh, they do not. But uh, I'm aware that uh, this, uh, this clash, this uh, not, not knowing what is really happening, this uh, uh, impossibility to, uh, to distinguish one from the other make, uh, make create quite confusion. So, uh, can we claim that images uh, deliver the, the, the reality? I say no, but in some instances we can. For example, if we subordinate the ontological otherness of the image to one's particular interests, what does that mean? It means that, uh, for example, uh, uh, it's very simple. Uh, it means that uh, every one of us is looking at an image uh, in such a way not to discover what the image wishes to present or represent, but uh, what he or she wants himself or herself to see in this picture. So uh, this is the thing that, uh, that uh, normally occurs uh, without even uh, having to, to, to think about it. This is, something, uh, this is something that we have innate in ourselves. And this is uh, basically what we call an ideology. So the ideology gives us the way how we will inter interpret images, no matter what they are, uh, what they ontologically are, and what they represent on a semiotic or semantic level. Uh, the other, the other occasion when we when we uh, are readily when we are ready to confuse images with reality is if we do not know that an image is always separate from what it depicts. I have already mentioned uh, this uh, iconic difference. Uh, I think uh, very uh, understated uh, understated theory of uh, what we burn, but uh, at the same time a very power, powerful one. Because uh, he says that uh, uh, an image, in order to be something uh, that exists in the world, but uh, different from the world or, or thrown into the world, we must always be capable uh, of uh, making the difference between image and reality. But uh, of course, with contemporary media, with uh, with uh, virtual reality, with uh, all other uh, technical capabilities that. Uh, that make uh, that make this, this this distinction very very difficult uh, to uh, to grasp. It is uh, it is very likely that in more more often than not in the near future as well uh, people can't take uh, uh, can't in fact grasp grasp this difference. So uh, it it may seem banal at first, but uh, if we can't, if you can't say. Uh, that what you are looking at a certain moment uh, is something that is uh, an image, I mean, uh, that is not a real uh, reality, uh, that is not simultaneous, then uh, you really can't have a, have a grasp of, uh, of uh, 
of any kind of, uh, of uh, meaning of an image. And the third, uh, the third moment when which this uh, can be uh, can, can be said is uh, if we don't account for the fact that some compelling visual phenomenon may not be an image at all, but a real event. And I think that uh, this is something that uh, was uh, the case with the uh, with the claims of Slavoj Zizek. Because uh, when we saw, uh, he, he wasn't sure if uh, these, uh, these things that were happening on 9-11 were, uh, were a real event, real event, or were they uh, something that was uh, televisualized, or uh, represented, or uh, broadcasting whatsoever. That's because, I mean, uh, he's absolutely not to blame, because uh, the way how this uh, event was, was presented, uh, it, it was really presented as something, uh, as something uh, that is, uh, that is uh, happening right now and uh, because we haven't, uh, uh, until that point, we haven't really got used to the fact that uh, what is really going on will be televisualized to us instantaneously, instantaneously at the moment. When it happens, we, uh, we all come to understand these images as, as something that has already happened. But it didn't already happen. It was happening at the same time when it was televisualized, and it was ontologically, uh, in my opinion, uh, the most uh, the most grave mistake that one can make uh, in uh, in relation to images, because uh, every image as a representation, basically, I will come to that later, uh, cannot happen simultaneously with the reality that is going on right now. An image in order to be an image or a representation uh, has taken at least, uh, I don't know, one tenth, tenth one millionth uh, of a time, time difference between the time the image was taken and that it was represented. So an image cannot be something that, is, that we see uh, instantaneously on a, on, a, uh, on a television screen or, uh, or whatever. So an image has to have uh, at least the tiniest difference between the actual event and the time when we see an image as represented. If we see something in, uh, in diretta, uh, come si dice, uh, in italiano, then, then it is not an image. Then in that case, it is only a visual phenomenon, but not a representation, not, uh, not an image. This is uh, also, I wanted to stress this because uh, my notion of, uh, of representation is maybe uh, somewhat different uh, from, 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 from other theorists uh, in the sense uh, that I, uh, I consider representation to be uh, not, not necessarily a depiction, not necessarily something that uh, describes uh, what, is, what is presented, uh, I don't know, painted. Uh, representation for me is a, is a way of thinking, is a, a way of uh, making, uh, making new reality, of course, uh, to, a, to a bigger or, or, or a lesser extent, based on a, on a real reality, but still, representation is something that we, that we in, always invent. For example, uh, uh, painting, uh, moving images, uh, film, uh, uh, whatever, photography especially, whatever we make, uh, these representations uh, are not based on reality. They are based on the, on the media for which the, they were made. They are based on uh, creative capabilities of, uh, of people who are, who are making those images and they are based on, uh, on uh, different, other, different other circumstances uh, that, uh, that uh, somehow, uh, somehow shape their, uh, their existence. Uh, Okay, but uh, what is my, uh, I would like also, because uh, this is a, a, a session on images, so it would be okay if I uh, show you some image. So, uh, my, my basic, uh, uh, when I said at the beginning of this, of this presentation that uh, my, my idea for, for this lecture was to be some kind of a plédoyer, I would like to, um, I would like to explain uh, uh, very shortly what this plédoyer is about, or for what for is it uh, is it about? Uh, this play is in fact a, a kind of a, um, a wish that we pay a attention more to images, not as a visual phenomena, but uh, as something that differs and is ontologically different uh, uh, from reality. So uh, uh, I would like to point to some to some movies that really uh, put to the fore this idea. Uh, 
more often than not, we, we, we try to find, uh, this is inevitable, everybody, everybody uh, does that, we try to find in a, in a movie uh, some level of reality, but the, the real movie goers, not to say nothing about, about specialism movies, not, uh, know very well that uh, movies uh, don't have uh, anything with reality at all, that, that they are uh, entities uh, on, the, on their own. But uh, in, a, in the times of, uh, of internet and uh, all other uh, visual, overwhelming visual phenomena, we, we uh, just forgot, forgot this thing. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, the way how can, we, how can we return to understand images as what they are, and this is a creation of new reality, not reproduction or not uh, representation, uh, I mean, uh, like a real, a super realistic representation of reality. So if we understand images as a kind of a, a creation of a, of a new world, then we will, have a, then we will uh, go back to this, uh, to this uh, basic uh, con concept of, of image that I will talk about in a, in a, in a few minutes. And this basic concept of, of, of an image, maybe you wouldn't believe, uh, but it goes back to, uh, to the Middle Ages, uh, it goes back uh, 1,500 years uh, uh, in, in history, and it is a very powerful platform to analyze also contemporary images. So uh, I'd like to show you a film by, uh, uh, an excerpt uh, from a film by uh, Terence Malik, his movie from uh, 2015, uh, Night of Cups. Uh, and let's say that this is the only movie that will, uh, that can, uh, that can prove some of my, uh, some of my thesis or some of my ideas, but uh, it definitely does so in a, in a very powerful manner. So uh, what I would like you to point your attention uh, when you were, when you were looking at this, this uh, insert is uh, the way how he conceives of, uh, of, uh, of moving, of uh, position of different, uh, of different characters. Uh, what they are doing? Uh, is there uh, is there uh, voices or uh, their uh, their gazes? How they are towards towards what and whom they are directed? Uh, and uh, based on this, you will see that uh, Terence Malik, as well as in many of his uh, other films, does the same thing. And that is the creation of reality that resembles very much to the reality we all know, but which is, is uh, in fact the reality. In itself, I mean, uh, the uh, the concept of a completely new uh, reality, a filmic reality, which is uh, which is uh, something that makes his his work artistic uh, artistic achievement. So uh, let's let's see this uh, this insert first. Sound from this my computer, which is which is. Hmm? I mean, it's not that uh, problematic, uh, but uh, what is uh, what, what is important to hear uh, to see uh, here to to see the images. Although the way he the, he combines sound, uh, for example, uh, uh, throughout the whole film you have the experience, uh, you have the impression that uh, this sound uh, comes from uh, from a single author who is uh, who is idol, uh, isolated in a kind of a kind of a uh, capsule or or a soundproof room because uh, you don't hear anything from the envi environment, and then suddenly you see that uh, this actor is in some very concrete environment, but this environment, in fact, doesn't affect what, what uh, in, a, in, in a sonic sense, uh, was going on uh, in the film. So, uh, let's, let's see a little, little bit more. So, for example, uh, uh, is there anything uh, so particular in the way uh, Malik, uh, Malik sh shot this film? Well, uh, I wouldn't say uh, I wouldn't say so. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he's so uh, always on the verge between uh, something which is ordinary. I mean, there are people, uh, 
there is sky, there are planes, there are cars. But on the other hand, uh, the, the relationship between people, the way how they are shot, uh, the way uh, their gazes are, uh, are, uh, are against, the way how they, how they talk, how they move their heads, uh, the way how camera goes with them, behind them or in front of them, is, is something that we cannot, uh, that we cannot uh, get to know in, in an ordinary life. So this is a combination of ordinary and extraordinary. This is, uh, in my opinion, uh, something like a, a metafilmic, uh, or me me metafilmic theory of picture. Uh, this movie explained what the pictures can do, uh, but at the same time uh, not running the risk to confuse images with reality, something that, uh, that I have started uh, my, uh, my talk. So uh, we can see also, uh, for example, uh, an excerpt from, uh, from a second, uh, just So uh, the film is basically the story about uh, Rick, uh, who is acted by Christian Bale. He's a screenwriter from uh, Los Angeles. He's uh, stuck with his, his job. Uh, he doesn't feel uh, like, uh, like doing it anymore. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he doesn't have any ersatz reality or ersatz life to, uh, to live, uh, so to speak. So he involves in relationship with, uh, with different women. And uh, this film is shot as a kind of a, kind of a uh, six stories, six consecutive stories, with uh, with his relationship uh, first with his brother and his father, and then with these uh, six women that he comes across during during a very very short period of time. But uh, what we'll what we'll see uh, at the end uh, is that uh, the cinematic procedure is uh, is uh, quite quite similar. To all of those, uh, all of those six parts. I mean, even though uh, all these women are different, and his relationship to these women are different, the way how image conveys their relationship is something that really matters for this film. Not so much the narrative, not so much uh, uh, what really happened between them. Uh, okay. Uh, But uh, I would like to now uh, switch uh, to go back uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit further in uh, in the past, and I wanted to show you that uh, in a I think really postmodern uh, postmodern way that uh, this what I'm talking about is not uh, does not has to do, does not have to do something only with our time, but uh, that these problems, the problems of the ontology of the image, what it really is, what does it represent how it uh, differs from reality, if, uh, if, uh, if it does in any way. I think this is uh, the major problem with the, that uh, went together with the humanity from their, uh, from their origins. So uh, we will uh, be able to understand images very well, not only if we read or, uh, I don't know, converse with, uh, with uh, very, very contemporary and very smart uh, theoreticians, which is of course something with, that we need to do, but uh, we have to go 2,000 years in the, um, or even uh, 5,000 years uh, in the past to, to, to see where this, uh, where this uh, delusion, delusion about the images uh, started and what the main problem with the uh, image theory was. So uh, I will, I will uh, start in, in fact with the, with the concept of Imago Dei. I will go briefly to these uh, concepts uh, in order to make my point uh, more clear at the end. So uh, the concept of Imago Dei wants to, uh, as, we, as we all know, refers to the, to the, to the fact that uh, people, the man is created in the image, in the image of God. So uh, here we see this, this first relationship. Uh, there is God who is invisible, on the, other, on the one hand, on, and on the other, there is man who is visible, and he is made on the image of somebody who is invisible. So this, uh, this aporia, this, uh, this so, uh, I would say, even frustrating, uh, frustrating moment when you, are, when you are made in somebody's image and you can't see your creator. You can't, uh, 
testify for, for yourself if, if that is really the truth. I think this is uh, one of the one one of the major uh, uh, the reasons for one of the major uh, uh, clashes uh, uh, during iconoplasm in the uh, Byzantine area. So the whole thing, the, the whole the image theory, in fact, started uh, with the Book of Genesis. It started with our very our very uh, beginnings with thinking about who we are, uh, why do we look like 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 we do. Uh, the second thing is, of course, uh, the second commandment, uh, which uh, the second commandment uh, which prohibits uh, that uh, people uh, show show images uh, images of God, not only images of God and of deity, but also images of, of any any other living uh, living creature. Uh, I think this is uh, another way how to put uh, this uh, this concept uh, of imago dei. Uh, if we can't uh, make any graven images of somebody who created us uh, on his own image, then uh, this concept of, of, of image uh, must uh, in itself uh, uh, have any real flaw, in fact. It has to be, it has to be flawed. Or, uh, to put it differently, we have to reconceptualize the concept of image and uh, not to believe anymore that images really represent something that is existent. Uh, I think uh, Imago Dei concept and, uh, and this prohibition, this ban on, uh, on producing images in Second Commandment is in fact uh, the way to deal uh, or to, or to reconceptualize, uh, reconceptualize images uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to build them as something that is different from reality. Although this reality is, uh, is invisible. Uh, in in uh, in the Byzantine uh, iconology, they call it uh, uh, the, they call it a prototypical image or, or natural image. Uh, the the second point that is very 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 important uh, for this for this debate is the iconoclastic dispute during the during the eighth and ninth century in uh, uh, in eastern in eastern Europe in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, especially the findings or the final insights of the Second Council of uh, Nicaea, which uh, uh, I wouldn't say unanimously, but uh, eventually uh, agreed upon the concept, which says that uh, worshiping images is uh, worshiping images is worshiping what the image represents and not who it who it represents. So. Uh, uh, during the 8th century, this, uh, this problem with uh, what, do we, what do we really look at when we look at the image is, I would say, uh, I would say res not resolved uh, in all its aspect, but uh, the path uh, from that moment on was open to, uh, to reconceptualize images uh, in a completely, completely different way and to uh, conceptualize them in a way that we understand images today. Uh, I, would, uh, I would like to remind you to the uh, uh, very, uh, very succinct uh, insight of uh, David Friedberg from his uh, uh, renowned book The Power of, Image of Images who said that the iconoclastic debate in the Middle Ages deals with the dangers that arise when we, when we identify an image with what it represented in it, or when we ident identify a representation with a prototype of reality. So this uh, idea that uh, images is reality, and uh, I remind you, we started uh, from, uh, from this confusion. Slavoj Žižek, when he said uh, that the images at the same time crea create a semblance, but also the reality itself, then it is uh, either uh, a contradiction in terms or we have to, or, or we have to come with a completely, uh, completely different uh, uh, theory, which, uh, which is of course, uh, which I'm, uh, I'm about uh, to do here. I, I would like uh, uh, just to, to remind you about a few things that uh, the, the patriarch, patriarchs uh, during the during the Middle Ages, uh, John of Damascus and uh, Nicephorus uh, from Nicaea, what were their, what were their main insights of, of, of images, just to. Uh, to show you how uh, this, these theories that we are so, uh, so deeply involved today uh, in fact uh, had their origins way, way back. And uh, something that uh, uh, Emmanuel Aloha, uh, my colleague from, uh, from Switzerland, uh, has, uh, has called uh, visual studies avant the letter, meaning that uh, 
even even in, in, in times uh, way back, uh, people were thinking and theorizing about images exactly in the way we are doing uh, now. So, uh, first of all, let's see what uh, this uh, John of uh, Damascus, uh, what were what were his uh, his main uh, main thoughts about about images. Uh, he said that uh, an icon is also an image uh, because, as you know, during the this iconoclastic the dispute, uh, the the most uh, the most heated debate was an, uh, among those who believed that there is a difference between an icon, something that uh, symbolizes, symbolizes or even uh, incarnates a deity on the one hand, and an image which only represents or uh, refers. Relay, relates in some way, in different ways, in fact, to, to, to this day. So uh, the iconoclastic dispute be what was be uh, between those who think that uh, uh, icons do have some kind of a, uh, incarnation of what they depict, while uh, uh, while Western Christianity uh, came uh, came to understand images as as a, uh, as basically a relational thing. So. John of Damascus says that, uh, said that the image bears the trace of God's presence not only as an icon, as a symbol, as, as I said, but also as a uh, direct connection. But look now, this direct connection is not, uh, is not this connection uh, like an uh, incarnation in icon, but a different kind of, uh, of, uh, con uh, of connection. He says, however, the invisible prototype, the Christ, or his natural image, is and the visible type, his image, are not the same. The difference is always visible. So this is a very, very uh, commonsensical uh, attitude, uh, because how can uh, something what you represent as visible be at the same time uh, uh, the same as something which is not visible? So uh, in, in this way, he showed that uh, uh, the image can in no, in no way uh, interfere with this, uh, with this uh, uh, with, with the deity, with the, this uh, almighty power of, uh, of of God, that it doesn't that Im the image in, in in any way does not interfere with uh, with uh, this ban ban on images proposed by the by the second commandment. The other uh, the other thinker of that uh, of that time was uh, Nicephorus from this this. Uh, uh, whose main stance, whose main uh, argument was that the, the, the difference between icon uh, and, and uh, an image, in fact, exists, but that this difference is uh, not ontologically crucial, and that it is only a matter of uh, a matter of degree. So uh, it's uh, not ontologically crucial, but uh, there are some uh, some points, there are some levels, there are differences uh, in how we perceive uh, images. And, and this is, in fact. Uh, uh, very, very con contemporary uh, thinking because, uh, for example, there are different uh, uh, younger among us uh, can't remember uh, cinemas uh, where, you could, where you could really tell that what was going on on, on screen wasn't on reality, uh, the, the reality. But today, for example, when you come to, to an IMAX uh, uh, cinema, uh, cinema hall, you probably get uh, full immersion into uh, not just into image but all, also into all sensory uh, all, all sensory aspects uh, of uh, of, uh, of a life. Uh, so Nikephor says that if the image in a way depicts or the prototype, I mean the God or the Christ. So for for, for them the natural image was something uh, was uh, how something looked like the, in the beginning naturally, but. Uh, uh, people didn't have uh, the access to that uh, uh, to that natural image. Nobody uh, didn't have an idea uh, or can't have an idea how God or Jesus Christ looked like. So the, uh, we inevitably had to invent or make some kind of, kind of a symbol or, or pictogram, if you will, to represent uh, them. So uh, if the image and what it depicts, the prototype could be the same, then the image either would not exist at all or would be an, an idolatry. This is another uh, commonsensical uh, thinking, uh, uh, proving that uh, what was uh, the, how this debate was, uh, was, uh, was concluded in the end. Uh, it was concluded that uh, uh, an image is uh, uh, always something which is different from, from, re from reality, but it doesn't have to be different if you wish to see in the image something that is represented or something that you don't have the right to wish. 
So it's not upon the image, it's not upon the, the, the medium itself what this image represents, but it only depends on the, somebody who is uh, looking at it. So uh, the icon is not an image of the deity, it merely symbolizes it, resembling the, prot the prototypical appearance of a deity. And uh, this is, for example, the reason why uh, the majority of, uh, of uh, Orthodox uh, Christian, uh, Christian uh, frescoes uh, were in fact done uh, in the same manner. Because uh, if, those, uh, if those frescoes, for example, Christ the Pantocrator is uh, one of the most, uh, one, one of the most uh, recurrent uh, uh, topics or, or scenes, why do they always, uh, or why did they always look the same throughout uh, 1,000 years? Because they were made uh, as a prototypical image. They were made as, as something, uh, they were made on the image uh, how people conceived of God, how he may have looked in their, in their opinion. So, if this is this, his prototypical image, if uh, this image symbolizes him, then there is no need to change this image. Uh, why, why should we change, change this, uh, the, uh, an image, uh, a likeness of somebody that, uh, uh, that was his prototypical image? That if he looked like that, as we thought initially that he did, then there, there is absolutely no reason why would uh, this image change. And that was the reason why uh, all, these, all these frescoes are in fact uh, done, uh, done in the same way and why their iconographical uh, uh, I, I, iconographical, uh, you know, catalog, so to speak, uh, wasn't so uh, wasn't so, so so vast or so rich as in the Western Christianity. Uh, in the Western Christianity, it was completely different because, it, uh, as I said, uh, uh, images uh, compared to icon to icons uh, were not uh, were not symbols. They were not resemblances. They were uh, they were relations. They were representations. And as I said at the beginning. Uh, this my uh, my idea of representation is in fact very um, very close to this uh, general concept of uh, Christian representation, meaning that uh, what we see uh, what we see in picture is not what it depicts, but it is something that we uh, some, something that we by seeing this image only refer or to Christ or to deity or to uh, some some saint or whoever is on the on the picture depicted. Uh, so. Uh, let me uh, let me now just uh, uh, make uh, make a few conclusions uh, 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 at, at this point. The icon is a symbol of the prototype, regardless of the resemblance it, it achieves. So the icon is a sum, is a symbol, and symbol don't change. If you change, for example, the symbol for a, for a toilet, people would uh, would not know where the toilet is, or would uh, create some other kind of uh, problem. So you you don't change a symbol as uh, uh, Orthodox Christianity didn't ch change uh, this symbol. Second, the image establishes, so the image in, com in confrontation to the icon, establishes a relationship of similarity between prototype and uh, representation. So, uh, if this is a, a notion of, uh, of a relationship, of course that this relationship changes. It changes over time. It changes uh, regarding uh, I don't know, uh, other technology, for example, uh, if, if, if uh, new pictorial technology, if, for example, photography or film uh, allow us uh, to make other kind of, uh, other types of representation, that we will uh, inevitably change also the, the form of this, uh, of this picture. And third, and which is also very important, the, both the icon and the image are ontologically different from the prototype. So they're, on, they're ontologically different from what they presu presumably uh, presented or uh, were about to uh, to present. So this uh, uh, we all uh, we, we, we should uh, we should uh, uh, come to uh, come to that first first thesis uh, with with Slavo Zizek of uh, about the about the confusion between uh, what what we were in fact looking when we were looking at this uh, this uh, uh, television. Uh, Preza Indireta during during the, the, the attack at the World, World Trade Center, uh, he said that uh, we at, at that point couldn't say couldn't say couldn't say the difference. But 
already those uh, med medieval uh, patriarchs or, or um, thinkers of, uh, of, uh, of that kind knew very well that uh, even between the icon and the image, there was a difference ontological from, from the prototype, meaning uh, from, from the, the reality or, or the deity. Uh, okay, uh, <clears throat> my first thesis uh, here uh, is that uh, understanding the function of an image can be either at the prototype, incarnation level, or at the symbol, representation level. So, uh, if you want to understand an image, you uh, need to know uh, what, what, what do you expect from it, not what, what it is, because uh, image can be, uh, as we said at the beginning, whatever you want it to be, but it depends on, uh, on your attitude, on, uh, on your ideological, political, uh, sexual, or whatever other agenda, it depends on you, what do you have, uh, what in fact do you want, do you want from it. And uh, the second thesis is uh, that uh, an observer can understand the meaning of an image only if he or she has taken a specific position in, in advance towards the very concept uh, of the image. That means that, uh, for example, if you look at uh, at a, at a movie, if you, if you look at the at, at photography, you always have to know in, ad, in advance what are you looking at. Uh, you cannot uh, you cannot understand what an image is if uh, if it doesn't reveal to you. No, no matter in which way it does so, but it has to reveal to you upfront uh, what kind of ontological entity is it. And only if you uh, are aware of this ontological entity of the image. Can you be sure that uh, you are looking or, or, uh, or to a simulacrum or to some kind of a virtual reality or that you are really in front of, of an image that uh, has its, uh, his uh, special, uh, um, special characteristic? Okay, uh, now to, to conclude, I think, uh, I don't know, if I'm, uh, am I okay? Yeah, okay. So, uh, to conclude, uh, I'd like to, sh to show you, uh, I'd like to come uh, again to where I started. Uh, to Terence Malick's uh, uh, film Night of, uh, Night of Cups and I would like to, see, uh, to show you in which way can we, uh, can we practically or put, to put into practice this type of, uh, of theory uh, but which is not, uh, I don't know, which is not a special theory of mine but uh, which is uh, uh, in fact uh, a story of, of how people, uh, of how peop of, of people's relation to images during the, during the time immemorial. So this was basically how, what, what people already knew about images. Uh, Giovanni Damasceno, uh, uh, Nikephoros from, from Nicaea, uh, they all knew these things, but we, uh, be, we tend to, uh, to forget them. We tend to, to forget these basic things that they have already discovered for us uh, 2,000 uh, years ago. So uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, I want to show you six consecutive, uh, uh, six consecutive scenes from the same film, from the Malik's uh, Night of Cups, where you can, uh, where you can see that uh, his procedure was uh, was so so focused. He was uh, so stylistically so precise in this film that all of these six different stories, which are uh, which are in the film, of course, presented. Uh, uh, in succession, one after the other, if we uh, see them simultaneously, which we will now, uh, which we will now see, uh, we will see what uh, what an image, which differs from life, which uh, differs from from the surrounding re reality, looks like. So let's see, uh, let, let's see for for ourselves. So these uh, six stories, I, have, uh, I must admit, I, have, uh, I found this footage on, on YouTube, but I, I couldn't uh, trace uh, the, 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 the copyright owner. Uh, so this guy or, or girl, uh, you know, uh, took these seven, six uh, consecutive stories and presented them as a, as a sim, simul, uh, simultaneous uh, uh, time, you know, uh, happening in time, in the same time. So uh, maybe I will repeat myself, but uh, when we look at uh, when we look at this uh, at, at this film, we we have the 
the impression that uh, we kind of uh, believe again in the power of images, that uh, it can really bring us something that uh, reality itself does not have. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a revelatory thing to know, or at least to, to look at the films that way, that uh, films can really um, remind you that there is not only reality that is real, but also uh, the fictitious things like films, like images in films, which are part of reality, but in their own way. So uh, the basic thesis uh, of, this, uh, of this lecture is, is in fact, what is, what, what is this uh, desert of the real? Uh, desert, of the, de desert of images. Uh, the desert of images is not the desert of the real. In the desert of the real, uh, you have only reality. You have nothing beyond reality. But in the desert of images, even though if you are in the desert, there are some, uh, some spots, some places, there are some oases in which uh, instead of palms or, uh, and uh, fruits that grow there, grow images, gr images that uh, will give us uh, maybe a new hope that the, the power of creativity the power of uh, reinventing the reality and not ju just the following it will is maybe uh, the way how to handle the future. So that's everything for me. Thank you. Okay.